Welcome to our program today, to our channel. We'd love it if you'd hit the subscribe button and hit the bell. We are in part two of Is Hell a Real Place? And I talked last week and I started off with that powerful sermon, a shaking sermon, and I'm not sure how popular it would go in our churches today, but I talked a little bit on Jonathan Edwards' powerful message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which he spoke to an apathetic congregation going through basically just the motions of Christianity. And he shook them up with the vivid pictures of hell. And he described them like a spider hanging over a fire held only by the thread of the grace of God and dangling over that fire. And he talked to people dangling. He talks also in the sermon about people walking over what seems like a secure bridge with a great fire below, not knowing that parts of that bridge are ready to collapse at any time and letting them know that their life is so temporal and that there's a heaven and a hell and that there's a, a heaven to gain and a hell to lose. And so a lot of people today, as I shared last week or last time, are really not so keen that we preach about hell. Certainly not even to mention, in fact, I asked you, when was the last sermon you heard anybody preach on hell? Um, it's not very popular. There's a number of subjects not popular. You don't hear a lot of subjects on sin, on uh, the horror of sin. And maybe, maybe I think we might do a, a teaching on really calling sin, sin. Not calling it by some other name. Not a sickness, a sin. Calling it for what it is. And so we've got preachers today preaching annihilation, that when you die, you're dead. That's it. You, those that are good and live for Jesus are going to go on to eternal life with him. The rest just going to die and death will be the grave. Well, you've got to do some pretty serious gymnastics with the word of God to get to that point, to get to that place. Others, conditional immortality, conditional immortality. I don't know too much about that. Universal reconciliation with everybody in hell getting another chance and even the devil getting saved. Well, that's... Um, I, probably something again that I've got my, well, that's not going to happen. Mark 9, Jesus talked much and I talked last week about the certain rich man being in hell and begging for his friends, his brothers, to hear the message so that they don't have to go to hell. I wonder how many people in hell today, and I believe in hell. I believe that Jesus spoke of it, and so I'm happy to speak about it. I wonder how many people in hell would be wishing that someone could go and talk to their family. But Jesus warned about it. Let's have a look at some scriptures here just to get into gear. And I, I'm happy for you to make comments. You may like what I'm sharing. You may dislike what I'm, what I'm saying and what I have been saying in the last session. And I'd love your opinion. I'd love your thoughts. I don't make a habit of preaching a lot of messages on hell. I certainly tell people there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I've done that all of my ministry life, and I will continue to. But uh, I don't major on preaching on hell, and I preach God is a good God. God is a good God. He's a wonderful Father. His love is eternal love, but he is also a God who is a righteous God, and he's a righteous judge. And I talked again last week, in the last session, about an age that spits in his face and curses his son, Curses his only son who hung on a Roman cross, coated in blood, dripping with his own blood, torn to pieces for man to be saved, and yet man spits, spits on the very image of Jesus and uses his name as a curse word and treats him as something that does not matter, that I'm sure enrages and stirs the Father, the great Father of us all. Jesus said this, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, for it's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. And where's that going to be? Where the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. 
I didn't say that. Jesus did. Where is that place? He says it's better to go in there without that hand that causes offence into that place where the fire is not quenched, never stops, and the worm does not die. He says if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to be cast into hell um, without that foot into that fire that will never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire does not quench. He talked again about your eyes. If your eyes offend, cut them out, he said. And then he says in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It seems that Jesus spoke of a place, a place for the unbeliever, the person that has committed gross sin, a place of outer darkness. The Bible speaks of it as a place of eternal fire in Jude 1 verse 7, a place of eternal punishment where the worm doesn't die and, die and the fire's not quenched in Mark 9. In the book of Matthew 25, speaking of the end of the age, the scripture says here that uh, the Lord will say to those on the left hand when he divides the sheep from the goats, he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And then in verse 46 of Matthew 25, again, he says of those that have been separated from the right and the left at the great white throne judgment, he says these will go away into everlasting punishment. He said it, I didn't say it into eternal and everlasting punishment. And here we read it in a number of areas. We read it again in Matthew chapter 13. And the Bible says, The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of the kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. There is a place called hell. There are so many scriptures. I began to just note the scriptures and I filled pages and on uh, one after another with scriptures dealing with, with eternity. And the Bible says of Jonah, just as Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, so in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. A lot of people believe, and the scripture says, he that ascended also descended, Believe that hell is in the center of the earth. It's somehow down under us in the center of the earth. They estimate the temperature in the center of the earth hotter than the surface of the sun. The temperature is said to be at the center of the earth something like 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Who knows where hell is? It seems like it's below. Jesus who ascended also descended. I read the scriptures and I'm not reading them with any sense of enjoyment at reading it but simply to say that in a world right now that spits in his face and curses him and and treats the gospel and treats Christianity treats Christ as a nothing thing in a humanistic secular humanist race of people now on the face of the earth that spit into the face of God and curse him sometimes I feel that to bring an understanding that there is an eternity to face and it'll be with or without Christ. And as I read the scriptures, it's either going to be with him in his presence forever or separated. And the only place I find of separation will be a great furnace of wailing, gnashing of teeth, of eternal punishment, of fire and of torment. And I can't read of any other place. My passion is to get as many people to come into a relationship with a risen Jesus, to come into a place with him where they come to know him as their Lord and their Savior. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. It's already condemned. But he said, I've come that they might have life and have it super abundantly. Jesus, God loved this world. People say, is he? A nasty judge. Is he a horrible despot? Well, he sent his own son to die a horrifying death on a Roman cross, tormented and tortured 
that you and I, by putting our trust in him, will never, ever take those steps into hell, but have passed out of death into life. I read of the end of the age, and I'm going to read a couple more scriptures. I don't want to read too many more. But in Revelation and chapter 19, let's read some of these. And, and dealing with the end of the age, Revelation 19 and verse 20 reads like this. And it says, Then the beast was captured, the Antichrist, with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of burning fire with brimstone. People say we don't need fire and brimstone preaching. I think people need to be reminded of the fact that here in the scriptures it talks about burning fire and brimstone that will be the final resting place, not just of the, the devil and his angels, but the Bible talks here and it says in, in uh, chapter 20 verse 10, Let's have a look at this. It says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night. And then it goes down further into 21, and it says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire. And the Bible says not only... Will the Antichrist, the beast, and the devil be cast into the lake of fire there to burn eternally? And I didn't say it. And the Bible says anyone that takes away the words of this book, the curses that go with it will come upon them. But God, Jesus laid it out and he said, I'm coming and I'm coming back for my church and I'm coming back for the people that love me. But those that, and he lists them, those that, that are not written in the Lamb's book of life, and those there in Revelation have taken the mark and the liars and the murderers and the people dying in their sin will be cast together with the devil and the Antichrist into the lake of fire to be tormented for eternity. And I can't get round it. I, I can't preach on annihilation or universal reconciliation. You know the reason? Because the word of God is specifically clear that there's a heaven and a hell. There's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to lose. And every person that's hearing my voice right now is going to spend eternity in one of two places. No question about that. The Bible makes that clear. It's appointed for every person who wants to die, not reincarnation, you're not coming back in another way. Every person wants to die and then the judgment and we're going to go on his right or on his left. And those on the left will be cast, as it says, into a place of eternal fire. Those, the scripture says in Matthew, the Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of the kingdom all things that offend and those that practice lawlessness and will cast them. Into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know, it's not a popular subject, but I felt strongly to share it today. To let people know that there is an eternal judgment. There's an eternity to face. You and I are spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. We're going to live eternally. We're going to live in one or two places. It's going to be in the presence of the Lord forever. Ultimately in the new Jerusalem. It's coming down out of the sky. We read at the, at the very end, a new heaven, new earth, and a new Jerusalem. We read this whole new thing. Behold, I make all things new. You know, Jesus didn't come to condemn you or me. In fact, he's not willing that any should perish, but his longing is that every person would come into saving grace, not willing that any should perish. It's not his desire for any person to spend eternity in hell. Maybe today you're listening to me and you're asking the question, is there a heaven, is there a hell? Well, I want to pray with you right now that you would find King Jesus as your Lord and know that you've passed 
out of judgment into life, that you're washed clean by the blood of Jesus. And he washes you clean and God looks and when he sees you, he sees you washed in the blood of his son and made righteous through his death. That's how much he loves you. People think of God as this horrible judge. He's the one who sent his only begotten son into this world to be torn to pieces, scourged with a Roman scourge, hung on a Roman cross at the hands of evil men. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today I give my life to Christ. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I open the door of my heart. I ask you to come in, to change me, and to make me new. I receive you. I give you my life. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd love it if you could contact us, leave a message for us. Tick life, like if you like what's shared. We'd love to hear your voice and hear from you. Um, also, um, tune in again. And we're going to touch on a few subjects. But if you've given your life to Christ, get a Bible. Start reading. Great book is the book of Luke. It's my favorite book for a new convert. It's really a very real, beautiful book to read. The book of Luke in the Bible. Read it as a letter to yourself. Find a great church that lifts Jesus and exalts Christ and live for him knowing that your sins are gone and that Jesus Christ and heaven are your eternal place of resting, that he is your king today. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in.